Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Fear. Here, we sense the agony of Jesus as he struggles with his Father's will. A struggling Jesus, a Jesus who at first wants something other than his Father's will, a Jesus who wishes to pass on the cup of suffering. If you're a Christian who believes that Jesus was not just a human being, but also the unique Son of God, the Word of God in flesh, then the scene in Gethsemane is shocking. It stretches our understanding and boggles our simplistic explanations of who Jesus really is. In Gethsemane, perhaps more than in any other scene of the Gospels, we see the fully human Jesus, the one who, in every respect, has been tested as we are, yet without sin. This means, among other things, that Jesus understands when we are tested, when we are weak, when we aren't sure we want God's will for our lives, when we fear. In Jesus, we have not a God who is watching us from a distance, but one who knows our every weakness and who is there to help us in our time of trial. May we find the courage to come before God with complete honesty, holding nothing back. May we pour out our hearts to the Lord. May we wrestle with God's will for us. And as we do, know that Jesus understands and is there to help us. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Betrayal. Judas betrayed Jesus with a kiss. In the culture of the time, a kiss was a sign of love and loyalty. A disciple might indeed kiss his master to signify the specialness of their relationship. From our perspective, it's easy to condemn Judas. Few people in history have been more despised, and for good reason. Yet by heaping still more disdain on Judas, we miss the chance to confront the Judas in ourselves. 
What about our own mixed responses to Jesus? How many times have we betrayed Jesus? Not in the obvious and literal way of Judas, but in our hearts and actions. How many times have we confessed Jesus as Lord only to enthrone ourselves as the true Lord of our lives? How many times have we worshipped Jesus with our lips, not with a kiss, but with words, songs and prayers, only to reject him in our hearts and actions? At daybreak, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and the teachers of the law, met together and Jesus was led before them. If you are the Messiah, they said, tell us. Jesus answered, if I tell you, you will not believe me. And if I asked you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, Are you then the Son of God? He replied, You say that I am. Judgment Have you ever wondered why Jesus wasn't clearer about who he was and what he had come to do? I certainly have. It seems like it would have been so much easier for all, including those of us who seek to follow Jesus today, if he had only said, yes, I am the Messiah, but not in the sense you expect. I have been anointed by God to bring the kingdom, but not in a military, political way. The kingdom is coming through transformed hearts, communities and cultures. Most of all, the kingdom is coming through my death, as I bear the sin of Israel, and indeed the sin of the world. As Messiah, I must also suffer in the role of Isaiah's servant. Yet Jesus didn't say this. When we confess Jesus as Christ or Messiah, we are acknowledging him as our personal saviour. But we're saying more than this. We're also recognising that he came to inaugurate the kingdom of God. Though this kingdom won't fully come until Jesus himself brings it, we get to share in the blessings and responsibilities of the kingdom even now. Our calling as followers of Jesus is to do the works of the kingdom so that the reign of God might invade this world. At the same time, we look forward to the day when all will be fulfilled. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entrance. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing round them, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, 
I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the cock crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the cock crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down. Disloyalty. Why did Peter deny Jesus? He was one of the first to follow Jesus, leaving so much behind to walk that uncertain road of discipleship. He had seen mighty wonders as his master healed the sick, cast out demons and even raised the dead. Peter had witnessed the miracle of the transfiguration, and he had even walked on water for a few brief moments. So why did Peter of all people deny Jesus? I can understand why he denied Jesus. In saying this, I'm not excusing his behavior. What Peter did was wrong, but I am saying that I can understand what he might have been feeling and why he did something that he later found so horrifying and inexcusable. Fear. Fear has the power to make all of us do or say that which we later regret. And though you and I might never deny Jesus in such a blatant way as Peter did, I would suggest that we might indeed deny him in less obvious ways, perhaps because of fear. Have you ever sensed that the Lord was urging you to do something for his sake, but then you chickened out because you were afraid? Have you known what it's like to downplay the significance of your faith in some conversation because you are afraid of what people might think of you? Have you ever let fear keep you from experiencing the fullness of life in Christ? What is the antidote to such fear? It is trusting in God. It is believing the word of Christ. It is experiencing the perfect love of God that casts out fear. We don't ever conquer fear through rationalization and mind control. Rather, we overcome fear by leaning more fully into the strong arms of God and knowing that he will never let us go. Very early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, the teachers of the law, and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You have said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So again Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they're accusing you of. But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Powerless. Pilate must not be excused for his central role in the death of Jesus. He alone had the authority in Jerusalem to sentence Jesus to death by crucifixion, and he must bear this guilt. Pilate is a paradigm of the person who fails to take responsibility for his actions. Perhaps Pilate really believed he was innocent of Jesus' death. Perhaps he was play-acting for his own political benefit. Either way, 
Pilate issued the verdict that sent Jesus to the cross. Yet he did so in such a way as to appear innocent of Jesus' blood. In some ways perhaps Pilate is powerless to stop what is happening, but he did not take responsibility for what he has done. How often do we do this sort of thing ourselves? How often do we rationalise our sins, blaming them upon others? How often do we fail to take responsibility for what we have done wrong, preferring to assign credit to our parents for raising us wrong, our society for mistreating us, our boss for abusing us, our space for misunderstanding us? Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they slapped him in the face. Torture. What cruel irony. Jesus finally received the words he deserved. Hail, King of the Jews! For once he wore a crown upon his head. Yet it was not the golden crown of sovereignty, or the olive crown of victory, but the thorny crown of suffering. We can't really imagine the physical pain, not to mention the emotional and spiritual anguish endured by the King of Kings. What incomprehensible irony. Jesus, the true King of Israel, endured the pain and mockery of the crown of thorns as part of his humiliation for us and our salvation. Because Jesus humbled himself, because he endured the humiliation of the cross, including the crown of thorns, therefore God exalted him to the highest place. For Jesus, the path to glory as King of Kings included the path of disgrace. Because he wore the crown of thorns, Jesus would receive the crown of universal worship. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. But they shouted, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Burden. Jesus had said this would happen. For quite some time he had predicted his suffering and death, 
So even though the Roman soldiers led Jesus out to crucify him, they were only doing what he had said they would do. Indeed, they were doing what he chose to happen, and in many ways caused to happen. After all, Jesus had been preaching that God alone was the true king, and that his kingdom was at hand. Not exactly the kind of message Rome liked to hear. And Jesus had been in regular conflict with Jewish leaders who saw him as a nuisance and a threat. Then he stirred up the crowds by riding into Jerusalem as a messianic king. He disturbed the Jewish officials by ransacking the temple and halting its sacrifices, accusing the temple leaders of being no better than a bunch of thieves. And so, although they led him out to crucify him, Jesus was no passive victim. He picked up his cross and walked to Golgotha because he had chosen the way of suffering. He believed this to be the will of God. Jesus chose to suffer and die so that he might fulfill Isaiah's vision of the suffering servant of God, the one who was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. As this servant, Jesus, has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Moreover, he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. A certain man from Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way in from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. Mercy. What a shock this must have been for Simon. On his way into the city, he stumbled into the horrific spectacle of a badly beaten man, stumbling as he was forced to carry the beam of his cross on the way to being crucified. As Simon watched in horror, all of a sudden he found himself pressed into action. No doubt Simon was hesitant, fearing that he might end up sharing Jesus' fate. Yet he knew enough not to provoke the soldiers so he took the cross as ordered. Unlike Simon, we aren't forced to pick up the cross of Christ. Jesus invites us to follow him, but even though he is our Lord, he doesn't force us against our will to join him. Rather, he beckons to us, calling us to take up our cross and offering abundant life in return. As he once said to those who are interested in following him, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, 
weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Tears. Luke notes that a great number of people followed Jesus as he walked to Golgotha. Luke implies that the great number of people were upset by what was happening to him. There's no evidence that they were egging on the Roman soldiers. And Luke makes this even clearer a few verses later after Jesus' death. And when all the crowds who had gathered there for this spectacle saw what had taken place, they returned home, beating their breasts. Jesus did not die primarily as a helpless victim of Roman or Jewish injustice. He chose to die on the cross in faithfulness to the Father's will, and so to bear the sin of the world. If anyone is to blame for the death of Jesus, we are because we have sinned. Thus, in looking upon Jesus' death, we join the women of Jerusalem in weeping, not only for Jesus, but also for ourselves. In the death of Jesus, we see what we deserve, and we rightly feel appalled. Then the mystery of grace sustains us. We realize that Jesus is bearing our sin so that we might be forgiven that he is dying in our place, so that we might live in his place. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Forgiveness. For many years now I've known that Jesus died for my sins. And even though I've staked my life upon this good news, there are times when it can almost seem old hat. Golgotha reminds me that the death of Jesus really happened, in a real place, at a real time. But there, the Lord of glory suffered and died for the sins of the world, and for my own sins. But there Jesus offered total forgiveness to those who betrayed him, those who disowned him, those who abused him, those who taunted him, those who were killing him. Total forgiveness for the world, for me. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us! But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, 
Remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Hope Three men being crucified, suffering excruciating pain, literally. One man begins taunting Jesus, sarcastically calling out for salvation he believes he knows Jesus can't deliver. The other, sensing something that he has never felt before, defends Jesus as an innocent victim. Then, in desperate hope, he cries out, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. In response, Jesus says a most astounding thing, a most encouraging thing, and a most curious thing. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Whatever the desperate thief believed about Jesus, it's unlikely that he prayed what we call the sinner's prayer while on the cross. Moreover, we have no reason to believe that Jesus straightened out the thief's theology before offering the promise of paradise. What we hear from Jesus is a source of monumental hope to each and every one of us. It would be unwise to build a theology of salvation without taking seriously this passage. God saves us not because we earn it, not because we deserve it, not because we say the right words and pray the right prayers, and not even because we get our theology right, but because God is full of mercy, a mercy revealed and poured out through Jesus Christ, a mercy that says to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. If this crucified criminal can have hope, then perhaps you and I can as well. We hope not in our goodness, not in our good intentions, but simply in the matchless mercy of God. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. family. The Gospel tells often of Jesus' attention to the needs of others, in this case to his mother, even in his hour of excruciating suffering. But what of Mary? What must Jesus' mother have experienced as she watched her son being crucified? We can only begin to imagine her pain. Yet Mary may have understood that the death of her son was part of God's mysterious plan. The Gospels don't tell us too much about her experience or faith at this time. She surely knew from the very beginning that Jesus was extraordinary and that God had something very special in store for him. There were moments when she probably understood that Jesus' destiny would not be an easy one for him or for her. When Simeon praised God upon seeing the baby Jesus, he delivered a chilling prophecy to Mary. This child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel, and the sword will pierce your own soul too. As we reflect upon the meaning of Christ's death, Mary's presence at the cross reminds us of the deeply human drama that is occurring. 
even as this drama points beyond to the majesty and mystery of God's plan for salvation. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Death. Luke's version of the centurion's response to Jesus' death seems like a glaring understatement. Certainly this man was innocent, rightly identifies Jesus' lack of guilt. It makes clear once again the fact that he didn't deserve to be crucified. He was no ordinary revolutionary, no guerrilla warrior, no terrorist. So yes, this man was innocent. We can't be sure why Luke fashioned the narrative of Jesus' death as he did. But we can understand that certainly this man was innocent, carried much more weight with Luke than it might seem. From the lips of the centurion comes something far more than a recognition of Jesus' innocence. It is an ironic confession of his character as the Righteous One, indeed as the Righteous One of God. Because Jesus was righteous, because he was innocent, not just of crimes that deserved crucifixion, but of all wrongdoing, he was able to make many righteous by bearing the sin of others. He became the spotless sacrifice for all people. Thus, his being the Righteous One is absolutely essential for his death on the cross to bring our salvation. And so this apparently simple expression of the centurion, certainly this man was innocent, turns out to mean much more than it suggests on the surface. Jesus was not just innocent, but righteous. And he was not just any old righteous person, but the Righteous One who came to fulfill the role of the suffering servant. Through his righteous life and through his sacrificial death, we receive the gift of his own righteousness. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. After Jesus died, his body was placed in a tomb. This was better treatment than many crucified people would have received. Their bodies were often discarded by Roman soldiers and left exposed, unless they had families or friends nearby to care for them. 
When the earliest Christians proclaimed the burial of Jesus, they were saying in effect that he really, really died. Jesus was not just a man, but the God-man. He was the Word of God in flesh, the one in whom was life and who was the source of all life. That Jesus died physically and that in the process he suffered the penalty of spiritual death for sin are mysteries far beyond our ability to fully fathom. How could the one who was the way, the truth and the life actually die? How could the author of life lose his own life? These questions still perplex me and they call me to wonder and they invite me to worship.